how can China or any country really adapt the forms of tall building design so it's not left with homogenous skylines that look the same from country to country or city to city? Uh, with the technology advancing so rapidly and information sh information sharing so efficiently and smoothly across different cities and countries right now, to be honest with you, the differences amongst the different cities in the same country or different cities in different countries is getting smaller and smaller. So uh, that is why we always emphasize uh, culture, cultural elements of the local city. Uh, it's going. It's getting increasingly difficult to um, to build a building and design a building uh, that is difficult from uh, the from its counterparts in another city in the same country or its counterparts in a, in another city in a different country. And looking at uh, the super, looking at so many super high rise projects that our uh, company has has been in, involved in, we always attach great emphasis to cultural elements of that city. We have to make sure that the culture of that city in question is already strong enough for us to really work on it and reflect it on the super high-rise projects. It also requires uh, the designers in charge of uh, that building uh, to be very skillful, uh, to, be, to be able to capture the minute minutiae of the local cultures. The Zifeng project in Nanjing City. As you know, Nanjing is famous for uh, being the capital, uh, being the capital of different dynasties uh, in Chinese history, and dragon is, uh, is an image representing imperial tradition of China, and we have this um, sort of uh, hidden dragon, uh, crouching dragons uh, design on this building. And then another example would be in Chengdu City, uh, the 468 project, uh, which we have deployed glacier-like concepts, which is famous in Sichuan uh, province. Those are great examples um, of high-rises that incorporate local cultural elements. Um, it leads me to ask, do you think that all of China's cities or all of China's major cities can have such iconic towers. It seems like everyone's you know, vying for attention on the world stage, not just in China, but in cities across the world, usually with iconic tall towers. Do you think that's a positive trend that should continue, or is it not right for some cities? Uh, starting from uh, the 1990s, the main battlefield for s building super high-rise buildings has shifted from Europe and America to Asia, including countries like China, South Korea, as well as um, United Arab Emirates. Uh, the trend is that those cities with um, great, with a prosperous economic development uh, would like to build a lot of super high-rise buildings. My viewpoint is that those Tier 1 and Tier 2 cities in China who are economically strong enough can and are capable of building a certain number of uh, super high-rise buildings. On the other hand, if you look at those relatively backward uh, cities, third-tier cities as well as four-tier cities in China, a lot of them do wish that by building a super high-rise or a certain number of high super high-rise buildings, uh, they can uh, they can catch more attention uh, from the market. That comes with great risks for those uh, third tier and fourth tier cities, but I cannot tell you was very specifically uh, or very generally that all of them have faced risks. What qualifies as a vertical community in your mind as opposed to a mixed use building with disparate or separate uses just stacked on top of one another? How would you define a vertical community? Starting from uh, the second half of the last century, uh, the Japanese and Americans have carried out a lot of studies regarding the so-called um, Cities in the Air project uh, that uh, focused on those super high-rise buildings ranging from 3,000 meters to 4,000 meters high. I would place vertical community right between the Cities in the Air concept and the uh, mixed-use urban projects. I don't see 
a, a vertical community as strictly a mixed-use urban project right now uh, because uh, we are talking about a super high-rise building that ranges from 500 meters to 600 meters or perhaps from 700 to 800 meters uh, in height. And um, I think it is not just a mixed-use uh, project. Instead, it is a place where uh, a different functions and aspects of uh, the city, of urban life can be uh, integrated, like <coughs> residential, for, uh, like residential part, office, uh, life, entertainment, etc. So nowadays we see uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, developers are calling their projects vertical communities uh, on their perhaps uh, on their projects that ranges from uh, a few hundred thousand square meters to even uh, more than a million uh, square meters. And I would say that it's not wrong to call that vertical community, uh, but it's not strictly uh, correct because it will be a quite distant in the future when we call, when we can say that, okay, we have vertical communities in our society because from a humanistic perspective, people will have the inclination to get down on earth and feel everything around them. Yeah, on that note, I wanted to ask you as well, if you think China, if the tall building boom in China and elsewhere is overshadowing important developments at ground level or how tall buildings incorporate ground level landscapes and how they should going forward. You have to understand that the strengths of um, or the advantages of super high rise buildings is uh, is the uh, non interruptive views uh, at the uh, at a high level as well as um, uh, sort of advanced um, facilities that and amenities that the residents uh, there can enjoy. Um, but uh, the the down the downside is the fact that a super high rise building usually um, accounts for a very small construction area. So uh, the space where the uh, the residents here can enjoy a great view is quite limited, to be honest. And uh, that is why in, in a lot of our projects right now, we focus really a lot on, um, built on bringing uh, the great landscape at the ground level uh, closer to the high-rise stories so that, uh, so that the residents in the building can enjoy more, can have a chance to uh, get closer to Mother Nature. Uh, and uh, some of the methods that we have adopted include atrium. Uh, how can we create sufficient density and still preserve architectural heritage? even in downtown districts of modern megacities that are expanding and building so rapidly? Well, first of all, municipal governments in different cities and different, con different countries have their own laws and regulations governing <coughs> the protection and restoration of those uh, historic areas or buildings. Uh, right now, we have two methods that we have um, ad adopted so far. The first one is to build a building uh, that is very harmonious with the overall uh, style of those historic buildings. Uh, uh, so and that's the first method. The second one is to draw a sharp contrast uh, with those historic uh, building styles uh, because you have to understand we do live in a different time and people uh, right now do have a different set of uh, aesthetics and uh, different cultures. And so uh, I can share with you this um, uh, great project that uh, we uh, we have uh, constructed here. Uh, we have constructed in Sydney, Australia. Uh, on one hand, we have built this uh, uh, modern-looking, uh, super high-rise building that is over 200 meters tall, and uh, right next to it is a historic building that has been uh, converted by us into a hotel. Uh, the municipal government of Sydney has made it very clear from the get-go that you should make sure the historic features uh, of, of, the, of that piece of architecture should be uh, restored and retained very well. So that is why uh, when we redesign the uh, facade of that building, we have taken into uh, our consideration uh, classical design. And um, so uh, you can see from this great example that modern and history uh, can coexist in a very peaceful way.